All right. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Timur. I work uh, at London-based music tech company, Roly. And um, yeah, I had the idea to come here to talk a little bit about audio and music software and how we use C++ as a language. So uh, this talk is called C++ in the audio industry. Can everybody hear me? Is that all right? Yeah. OK. So um, I had this idea, and then I was about to prepare some slides for the talk. And then I thought, OK, what could I talk about? And uh, I had like several things I could talk about. So there's the real-time aspect of audio when it comes to programming. Then there is, um, if you generate audio, you're typically doing math and DSP. So you want that to be really fast and efficient. Then, for example, at Roly, we do this um, Seaboard. It's essentially a keyboard with a 3D touch surface. And there is an audio engine running on an embedded system in there. So there's also very, very interesting things that you could talk about that in this context. Also, um, you want to do audio on different platforms, on desktops, on mobile phones. And there are interesting cross-platform challenges there. And uh, also another thing, if you want your audio to be fast, there is the whole topic of ZIMD and vectorization and memory alignment. And there's a few interesting things in the audio world um, about that. And then I had all these things. And then I figured out that, OK, if I'm going to talk about all of this, I'm going to be to be talking for 10 hours. So I had to uh, limit this talk to something. And I thought, OK, what's the defining uh, thing about audio, uh, which is different from most other use cases of C++. And I think that's really the uh, real-time aspect of it. So I'm going to talk about real-time programming and why that's different probably from other uses of the language. And if you want to do real-time programming, you want to do log-free programming as well. So I'm going to talk about that. And I'm going to show a few code examples. Um, so I'm going to start with an introduction to what I mean by the audio industry. and um, how actually audio is rep or sound is represented in C++ or in a C++ application. And then I'm going to talk about what, why audio is real-time programming and what it actually means, and how you write code so that it's real-time safe, and uh, show a few code examples about uh, log-free programming, how you synchronize your threads log-free in a context uh, for audio, uh, which will involve how do you share objects between different threads, how do you exchange data between different threads if one of them is a real-time thread? And a little bit about how to manage memory, how to um, manage object lifetime, and these kind of things. So what's the audio industry? Probably different people have different definitions. But um, so I think it's uh, about people who use computers and computer software to produce music, to record music to make sounds, to compose music. Then there is this aspect of uh, people who use uh, computers, like this guy here with the laptop, to perform music live, DJs, performers, musicians. Then there is this whole world of uh, games and audio apps on desktop and mobile platforms for consumers, multimedia apps. Then there is also science and art and creative coding, where audio plays a big role. And then also, um, there are people who actually develop all the software for people who create musical instruments, synthesizers, and music software and hardware. And this is, this is more or less my domain. I work on the Juice framework, which is a framework, an application framework, but also features a lot of audio for people who want to build applications with audio in them on different platforms. So I'm a little bit biased towards um, providing tools for developers, and also this whole audio production music world, like having musical instruments, this is the C word here, having um, synthesizers and audio software running. So this is sort of a little bit my bias, but I'm, I'm going to try to keep it a bit more generic, not too specific. So um, question, who has ever here used actually audio or programmed actively C++ for audio and sound things? All right, about half. All right, so maybe it's worth to do like a really quick introduction about for all the people who didn't raise their hands, how audio actually works in C++ or in a typical C++ program. So um, audio essentially is a representation of sound waves. So here's a sound wave. 
And obviously we can represent this digitally, we can manipulate sound digitally. But the C++ language itself has no concept for it. There is no concept of audio in the language. So we have to use third party libraries, we have to use APIs, and we have to use the conventions um, offered by these APIs and libraries. And sort of the, the universe we are um, sort of um, in is defined by like a big stack of different components. So essentially we have the sound waves that we can hear and then uh, we have a microphone that can record them and then we have an audio digital converter and then it goes into a sound card. And then we have some sort of driver for the sound card and some sort of API by which this driver talks to the operating system. We have lots of different operating systems. We have Windows, Mac, Linux, we have on mobile, we have iOS and Android. You also have maybe embedded platforms. And then all of these uh, operating system, the systems, they also have their own stack of audio, layers of audio APIs. And um, at the end of it, there's some API that's offered to, to the user, which you can use then to program your own audio app. So, and there are many different ones. So Apple offers Core Audio and Windows, there are several ones. So it's like a whole set of different, completely different APIs. Uh, and um, this is what your audio application is talking to, to um, exchange audio data. And also the other way around, if you want to output audio, it goes all the way the other direction through all this chain through some kind of speaker, which actually transforms that to a audible audio signal. And in the world of music production software, we have actually an additional layer where we have something that's called a digital audio workstation or a door. And there are several competing doors which people use to produce and record and mix software. And then um, these doors offer you um, plugins, so you can, like a plugin interface, so you can create synthesizers or audio effects, um, and then these will be a plugin, essentially a dynamic library, a DLL, that is loaded into that host. And then to have these, it's like, you can imagine like Photoshop has plugins, it's something like that, except that there are different competing hosts and also actually different formats and SDKs for these plugins. So you will be coding against one of these SDKs and then your audio plugin that actually produces sound or manipulates sound will talk through that API to some host and then it goes all the way to, through all this chain. So um, one of the things that we are doing with the Juice framework is we try to offer a solution where you don't actually have to worry about this stack because you can also imagine that on every operating system this whole audio stack is different and all the conventions are different and um, so what you want to do is basically abstract all that away so that you can have a means of writing your app, which is maybe a plugin or a standalone app, and do s sound and do a graphical user interface and all the other things that you need for, a, for an application. And then you have a framework underneath that hides all this complexity. Um, but here we are going to talk about the audio part. So let's talk a little bit about audio data, how it's represented. So. Um, Essentially, if you have like a waveform like this, which is just a little snippet of sound, then to represent it digitally, you would um, sample it, which means that you would, at regular intervals, you would represent the value of that waveform with um, a number, which, is, which are the little blobs here, which are the audio samples. And um, then you have a certain amount of samples per, per second. That's the sample rate. Like a typical one is 44,100 hertz or samples per second, pro for example, the, s the sample rate used for by an CD. And you can use also a higher sample rate depending on, um, depending on your use case. I'm sure you all have seen this setting, this sample rate setting somewhere in your software. So this is how many samples per second you have. And also this way of sampling sound has lots of implications. There's this Nyquist sampling theorem and um, aliasing and all these things which I'm not going to go into here. But um, so you have samples, you have a given amount of samples per second, and then the other convention is um, usually in this kind of C++ software, you would use floats in the range of minus one to one to represent that. I mean, there are many, many other ways to do this, but in this context of audio running on desktop mobile platforms, typically you would have floats between minus one and one, which gives you about 24 usable bits of information per sample. And some people say double is better, but I can't hear the difference personally. I don't know, I'm not sure if double is actually better. So you have enough, uh, enough um, bits to represent um, sound. And also um, you need to stay between minus one and one because otherwise if you go above, you will have some very harsh clipping distortion, which you would hear. 
So this is sort of the conventions that you're working with. And the other thing is that you might have several channels of audio. So typically you will have at least like a left and a right channel, or if you're surround, you may have six. Or, and then we would have an audio frame, which is basically one sample per, per channel, which will be an array of floats. And in this case, it would be two floats, representing one little snippet of audio, which is just a tiny fraction of a, micro, of a millisecond. Now, um, if you want to output sound or you want to get sound input, you have to talk to your audio card eventually through this whole stack that we saw earlier. So you would, um, your audio card would ask you, give me, give me the next sample. And you would receive some sort of callback. Now, um, it's very, very inefficient if you would, uh, for every sample, 44,000 times per second, you would uh, get this number from your program. You would receive 44,000 callbacks per second. That would be very inefficient. So typically what is done is that you transmit audio between this whole stack in so-called audio buffers, where you take a chunk of samples, somewhere typically between 32 and 1,024 samples. It's one audio buffer. And this is the size of audio data that's transmitted back and forth between the different applications and APIs. So one buffer will essentially be a uh, array of arrays of floats. So the first dimension would be the channels, and the second dimension would be the individual samples in one buffer. So, um, and basically what you want to do is you want to exchange these buffers with, the, with your audio card. So um, typically the means of doing that is a callback function, which uh, simplest possible one is here. Uh, so you have a callback which gets um, the data, the actual channel data. That's one buffer, as we saw earlier. Then you need to know how many channels you have and how many samples you have. And then basically you loop through the channels and you loop through the samples and then you do some calculations to actually generate sound or maybe you get the sound. And in this very simple example, what you do is you get, uh, you're just writing zeros, which is always like the least thing you want to do because if you're not writing zeros, then your audio card will receive garbage or uninitialized memory and you will have some ugly noise. So, um, but of course in real world, you would not write zeros, but you would actually have some math that generates your audio. And uh, in the more general case, you have inputs and outputs. So you would have one uh, pointer to the audio data that's coming from the sound card and another array that's going to the sound card. And for example, you can take the input, transform it somehow, and then send it back out. So that's like, um, that would happen in here. So this is this, is this kind of uh, audio callback, which is the means by which you exchange audio data. So um, to give you just an example, so um, this is the producer. This is um, uh, a live coding C++ IDE, which uh, we are presenting here this week, which we, want, we are about to release. Um, so if you want to know more about this, I recommend you to uh, go on Wednesday to the talk by Julian Stora, sitting right here, who is the uh, original author of Juice, and he's going to talk about the producer. But here I'm just going to use it for my little demo. So um, this is essentially a little app. And here you see that audio callback. So now we have here just some, we're just outputting some sounds. We're just using one channel. And basically what I'm doing here is um, I just have a sine wave. In practice, you would not probably not use the sine to generate it. There are more efficient ways of doing this. So we're just generating a sine wave uh, with a phase that's just counting up, and we are sending that to the audio card. And that's all we're doing. And uh, if I run this, we get a sine wave, which sounds like this. Also, this is a little, little class that I wrote, which is just like an oscilloscope. It shows you the waveform. So that's the actual waveform that's playing. Now, um, by Changing the, 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 the math that generates the audio, you can, you can generate different sounds. So for example, in the next line, if I just comment this out, should recompile again. Yeah, so that's a square wave. So um, basically, instead of generating a smooth sine wave, I'm saying std copy sine, which makes it just minus one, one, minus one, minus one. So it looks like this, so it's a bit, a bit sharper. Uh, or I can just, that's the next line here. I can just output some random numbers here. Right, I know that rand is not the proper way to generate random numbers, but for this purpose, it will serve. 
So it's just random numbers between minus one and one. And um, so, for example, um, uh, yeah, I couldn't uh, change the level here. Oh, I think I introduced the syntax error somewhere. All right, so um, basically, I'm just going to quit that. So basically, um, the whole way of synthesizing sounds is to go into that audio callback, and eventually you have complicated formula to um, generate all the sound that you want. There's many ways of synthesizing sound, sampling sound. So I'm not going to go into this. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the C++ aspects of it. So um, because it's, you have this audio callback, um, audio is so-called hard real-time programming. I'm going to talk about what that actually means. And I think this is the big difference between the audio world and most other applications of C++. So what do I mean by hard real-time? So we have here this uh, waveform. And uh, we split it in audio buffers. And we want to send these buffers to the, to the sound card, right? Now, um, the sound card has a little quartz crystal here, which gives you, depending on your sample rate, gives you a regular, regular pulse. And uh, every, for example, 44,000 times per second, it will, oh no, actually less because an audio buffer is, for example, 32 samples. But every, let's say every millisecond, it will ask you, give me the next audio buffer, give me the next audio buffer, give me the next audio buffer. And then it will call the callback, then you have a little bit of time to write all your audio data into that buffer, and then it's going to send going to be sent to the audio card. And then one millisecond later, it will be the next callback. Give me the next buffer. And um, the problem is that um, this audio callback doesn't wait for anything. No matter what happens on your computer, after one millisecond, or however your setting is, there will be the next callback. And you will need to react to it. And you will need to have written your previous buffer into your previous data into that buffer. So. Um, that's what I mean by real time. Um, and if you look at the, like the time scales that, that are involved, so if you have an interactive performance, like if, for example, you have a keyboard, you're playing it, and you want to hear the sound as you play it, you have like a, a window of about like 10 milliseconds of overall latency where it feels really uh, like it's live. You don't feel any delay. Uh, if it's somewhere around between 10 and 30 milliseconds, like a pro professional performer will already feel, OK, that there's like some paper or something between my fingers and the keyboard. It doesn't really feel live. And then if it goes above about 30 milliseconds, then most people will hear like a delay, like a latency between if you strike the key and you hear the sound. So it's all right if you have like a multimedia player that plays something, or if you have if you're just offline like mixing some sound. But if you want to actually perform, you really want to be more like somewhere here. And that's the overall latency of your whole system. So it means that if you have this audio callback in your, in your program, then definitely you, will, you, will, you want to use, it's like a compromise between a small buffer size and like, syst like system load, like how much your processor can handle. So if you work with a, with a small buffer size of 32 samples, and you work with a 44,000 uh, hertz sample rate, then a buffer is just under one millisecond. So if you add the whole, the whole rest of your system to the latency, then you can stay below 10 milliseconds. But then you have uh, more than one callback per millisecond, and you have to generate your data in that time. And depending on how much you run on your system or how much algorithms you run, this may, over, this may be a lot of uh, stress on your CPU. So if it goes too much, you can increase the buffer size, and you have a little bit more time to compute your audio or to process your audio. And then you will have less system load, but then you will have more latency. So it's always this kind of compromise. And um, so we are working with these um, times of in the range of about one millisecond. And uh, if you imagine you have this callback here, and then you generate your audio, and in practice you will not have like a sign in there, but you will have an arbitrarily complicated amount of a chain of complex algorithms which compute maybe reverbs or take like a file from, want to play a file, file sample from the disk and apply some complex DSP effects on it. But what we, want, what we need to do is we want, need to guarantee that after this 0.7 milliseconds, for example, 
this function will have computed everything. This function will return in time and the output buffer will contain valid audio data afterwards. And there will be no error or exception and this function will always return in time and will always be done with its calculations. And if you fail to do this, so yeah, and you, you really want this to be no except because it should not throw an exception. And if you fail to complete that function in time or uh, otherwise you generate an error in this, in this callback, then you will get what we call an audio dropout or a glitch, which is basically, you can hear it like as a, as a crackle or like a, like a sound and it's immediately audible. Even if you have a, if you drop just one buffer, you can hear that. Um, so, um, and the most important number one rule of audio code is you, you never want to cause audio callbacks, uh, audio dropouts, never. And the reason why you never want to uh, cause audio dropouts is imagine you're in the situation of this guy. So you're, you have your laptop here which runs some software which calculates some audio buffers and you're playing in front of all these people and then you have audio dropouts and then maybe you have like a 15 kilowatts uh, PA running there and then if you have an audio dropout, then in worst case, you will first blow the speakers and second, everybody in the audience will go deaf. <laughs> so you definitely don't want this to happen like ever. And um, the other way around, if you are getting audio data from the audio card, it's actually really the same story. Imagine here, like you have an orchestra playing something and then you have a massive studio where you run some you, run the, you record them and you run like a big mixing rig, but in the end you have also like an audio callback which gets some buffers and writes them into the disk. So that's essentially what happens. And if you just drop one buffer and fail to write this on to the disk in time, um, then yeah, you can do the whole recording again and you can ask all these people, please could you just repeat the whole performance because I failed to write an audio buffer in time. So you never want to cause audio dropouts. And I think that's like the defining characteristic of like real-time audio programming. And the other thing is that not only you want to um, be done with your writing or reading your audio buffer in time, but also this time should be significantly shorter than the time that you physically have if you're talking about a millisecond between the different buffers. And the reason for this is if you have something like this, this is traction, this is a um, door, like a production, music production software written with juice. And here you have maybe like a hundred different tracks of audio, all the different instruments. And you want to, to record that. And you have like on every track, you have like several effects plugged in. So maybe you have a reverb or a delay or distortion effect or, and all of these plugins and all of these tracks, they all have their, their audio callbacks running. So you don't have one of them, but maybe you can have several hundred of them. And still you want to com compute Every, every single buffer in time. And um, I think that's, that's the, the big difference between audio and almost everything else because obviously we all care about performance. That's why we use C++, that's, that's why we're all here. But if you have, for example, I don't know, you run a server and you want the server to process one million requests per minute or I don't know, you, you're writing like a video game, you want to, to have like a really high frame rate on average or and in all these cases, um, you want to have like a high throughput. Or maybe, I don't know, you're mining bitcoins and you want this whole calculation to be finished in a reasonable amount of time. So it's about the average performance, the average throughput that you care about. But in audio, you really care about every single time if you call a function, you have to guarantee that this function will stay below like an absolute uh, bound of how long it can take. And you must always, it's like a contract, you must always be finished with that function call in time. And I think this, this is like a very specific thing that changes, that changes a lot of things. And um, if you do this in C++, then um, C++ itself, in itself is not a real-time safe language, which means that in C++ you can't declare that a function must be finished in one millisecond. There's no way in the language to do that. There are languages you can do that, but C++ is not one of them. So in order to fulfill this real-time guarantee that we need in audio, you need to do this by the way how you write code. And um, yeah, there are certain good practices or bad practices or things that you should and should not do in order to fulfill that guarantee. 
And uh, actually, the next rule of audio code is um, if you want to do this, if you want to succeed, you should never do anything where you can't predict how much time it will, it will take, because you always have this hard real-time guarantee. So if you don't know if, if you function you're calling in there will be done in 0.01 millisecond, don't call it. Which means you never want to block. You never want to wait for anything, because you don't know how much time it will take. So uh, you should not, uh, you cannot lock a mutex, or maybe try to lock a mutex and spin on that. It's even worse, because it's actually busy waiting. You should not join a thread, because you have no idea like when will this thread actually be, be done. And actually, you can't really call anything that blocks or waits in any way, and especially you can't call anything that blocks or waits for anything internally which is much harder because you don't know what's happened inside. And there are surprisingly many things that block or wait internally. And what you really want to do is you want to do log-free programming. So, um, and why you shouldn't block? I think uh, by now with modern computers, like the time that it actually takes to lock or unlock a mutex is not a problem. The problem is that um, uh, if you're waiting for something, you, you have no idea, if you, if, if you don't know how long the code you're waiting for will take. So in most cases, you're waiting for code on another thread, which is in itself is not real-time safe. It does not fulfill this real-time guarantee. So if you do that, you get an audio dropout. And the second reason you don't want to block in the audio thread is a thing called um, priority inversion, which is that... Um, this audio callback typically runs on a very high priority system thread. But if it blocks and waits for another thread, then that thread will be a lower priority thread. And that means that if you have like an operating system and thread scheduler, then that lower priority thread might itself be interrupted by other threads. So you might not only wait for the other code to finish, but also you might wait for completely unrelated different threads because you're waiting for a low priority thread. So that's priority inversion. And really the only way to get away with this is, if it comes to audio callbacks, just only run lock-free code. Which means you should not call new and delete, because that's not lock-free. It will internally have a lock that may wait for another thread. So you don't want to allocate or deallocate memory. And you should not probably not call new or delete yourself anyway, but also you should not use any error I objects like chat putter, for example, that do that internally. And there are many, many, many functions which are not lock-free inside. Like if you do a std vector pushback, then if the capacity of your vector is, is, um, is over, then to push back another element, you, the vector may reallocate all its content, which is definitely not, not lock-free because it allocates memory. So uh, you can't call vector pushback in the audio callback. What you need to do is you... Um, Probably the best way is to work with data on the stack. Or if you need data on the heap, you should pre-allocate it. You should be careful when this data is deleted. You can use containers from Bruce Intrusive, for example, which are similar to SDL containers, but they don't own the object. So you have to handle all the pointers yourself. Or you can use Boost Lockfree, which offers uh, several containers that are lockfree itself. Uh, and also you can use uh, custom real-time safe containers, like lock-free, queues, stacks, lists. There's a lot of literature in there. And also in Juice, we offer several um, data containers for this purpose. Um, and for larger systems, you really want probably to manage your own heap, where you have some pre-allocated chunk of memory and you have a lock-free way of accessing it. Uh, you also don't want to call uh, any kind of input-output functions like cout, printf, in the, in the live coding demo I did earlier, if you, if you do like a printf in there, you immediately hear like the crackles. Um, you don't really want to communicate with any other processes. Definitely you don't want to access any files on the disks because this will most likely take more than the 0.1 millisecond that you have. You don't want to talk to the network, so, and you don't want to do any graphics rendering either. So all of these things you have to do on other threads, and you have to synchronize them with your audio thread in a log-free way. Um, you should also probably in the audio callback not call any third-party code because usually Microsoft or Apple or other vendors, they don't document whether their functions are real-time real safe or not. 
no, no documentation says this function is guaranteed to take less than one millisecond time. Never seen that in a documentation. Um, and also you have to watch out for um, worst case behavior because here you don't worry about average behavior, you really wor worry about the worst case. For example, if you have a hash, hash table like an unordered set, inserting or looking up something is constant time, except it's not, it's amortized constant time, which means that once in a while, the whole container may say, oh, I'm gonna have to rehash all my content now. And you have no idea how long this will take. So you cannot use that. And the other thing is what you can't do is you should not run into page faults. And this is an interesting one because I think for most people this is something that was probably an interesting problem maybe 20 years ago when computers didn't have enough memory and since long forgotten and you should not care about this. But in audio there is a specific use case where this is actually still, still a problem that you should think about. And this uh, use case is so-called sampler instruments. How this works is you have, um, there are loads of them on the market we have also one, one, of, one sampler in our equator synth at Rolly. And how it works is you sample a musical instrument, like a drum kit, for example, and you have little sound snippets for every single drum or every single note that this instrument, instrument can hit, maybe in different articulations. And you have a keyboard, and if you, if you basically press a button on that keyboard, you want that little audio snippet to play. And then you can easily have like a one or two gigabytes, uh, gig, sorry, gigabytes of these uh, samples. And... Um, you don't know which, which uh, key the user will hit next time, but if the user presses the key, you want to hear the sound. And if you have two gigabytes of memory, which your application uses, there's a high chance that some of this memory, if it's not used, it's going to be paged out, it's going to be maybe swapped onto the disk or something, and then when you actually access it, it ha you generate a page fault, it needs to be paged in, and this whole process will probably take longer than the time that you have. And um, so for these kind of uh, music software, um, it's actually a problem in practice. And um, there's two solutions basically to this. Either you can have like a low priority thread, which uh, regularly says, okay, I'm gonna use this memory, so you can access this memory, so it stays hot, it stays into, um, or uh, actually the more, the better solution is that modern operating systems, they all offer some APIs like mlock, mlock on Mac and Linux, or virtual lock, virtual unlock on Windows which lets you lock, um, lock memory into the virtual memory, so it's not gonna be paged out. Um, and um, unfortunately, there's nothing uh, in the C++ standard or in, in Boost for that, so you have to rely on platform-specific things. And also, probably you don't want to call that yourself, but you want to wrap that into some kind of smart pointer, or you want to write your own STL-compatible allocator for that. And it's really tricky to do, so probably uh, what's better is actually to have some kind of pre-allocated memory for your application which is locked into memory and then you need some kind of custom heap management to do that. So um, yeah, I'm not gonna show any code that does that because it's quite complicated in practice and could take a long time. So um, I'm just gonna summarize why do, we, why do we use C++ for audio. So obviously um, most of the audio APIs are actually C or C++. So it's very convenient. Then as we all know C++ is fast, it's close to the metal. But then also it allows you to use custom memory management and it supports concurrency. The C++ 11 and 14 standards have atomic in them. So they have atomic types. They allow you to have lock-free access and they allow you to program lock-free. And in the end, for audio, it, this, this whole thing allows you to write real-time safe code, which is what we want to do. We, um, look how much time we have. All right. So, um, so here's basically the situation. You have you have one audio thread, which always gets these audio callbacks. Give me the next buffer, give me the next buffer, give me the next buffer. And then maybe you have another thread with a GUI, uh, with a graphical user interface where the user can uh, turn some knobs and these will have an effect on, on the audio. And this maybe runs on some kind of, of message loop. Then maybe you have some, some hardware connected where somebody plays on a keyboard and the keyboard sends messages to your application. We have protocols for that like MIDI and OSC and you have a thread which receives these messages. And then you, maybe you have another thread that reads or writes data from and to the disk. And somehow you have to synchronize all these things, uh, but you have to guarantee that your audio callback will always be real-time safe. And that's like the, the, the big, I would say, the big challenge in audio software. Basically, this thread should never block. So let's look at a, um, 
very simple example. You have a, a knob which changes the level of your audio and the user can turn that with the mouse and this should affect the audio thread. Now, uh, the easiest way to write this, and actually I've seen many people writing code like this, is that you have, that's your level, that's just a float, and then you have, in the GUI thread, you get some callback from the mouse event and then the level is changed. And then you have, in the audio callback, you have, um, that's your audio callback, and then you just multiply that level with some buffers and you send that to the audio card. Now, um, that's a race condition, right? And um, even though it's just a float, since C++11, this is actually undefined behavior. So even though uh, float is actually, on most uh, architectures, this will be atomic, like reading or writing a float, the C++11 standard says that concurrent access to the same memory is a data race. It's actually defined in the standard, and a data race is always undefined behavior. So you don't want to do that, even though this code, this specific code with the one float will run you will not have problems with this code, but as soon as it gets a bit more complicated than that, you can get loads of problems. So you definitely don't want to, to write code like this. So you can get undefined behavior. The access to your data can be not atomic, which means that the thread may see a value that's like in between the old and the new value, it's called a torn read or a torn write. Also, you have the problem that if you write code like this where you don't use any locks and it's not atomic, you are uh, you can have compiler optimizations that break your logic because the compiler thinks, oh, you're not, you're not modifying that code and there's no lock or no synchronization anywhere. And then also, if you just use plain float, the concurrency is not expressed in any way in your code. So, um, and the fact that X is not atomic is actually, even for fundamental types, is more surprising than, than some people think. Like, for example, if you have not a float but a 64-bit integer, which is a fundamental type, uh, and you just uh, set this to, to some value in one thread and, and read it from another thread. And you compile that with GCC for 32-bit, which is an actual use case, because if you do audio plugins, you want to compile them in 32-bit, because many hosts, they just understand 32-bit plugins. And if you compile that, then that's the assembler output you get. So actually, GCC, um, even on a 64-bit, even if, if the system is 64-bit, if you compile for a 32-bit uh, if you compile a 32-bit uh, plugin or program, then this will be two reads, and this uh, this will be sorry, this will be two reads for the least significant bit and for the most significant bit, and this will be two writes. So, if you if you write the value here, then here you will actually see maybe like a two, where you see this this byte, you will see this part of the number, but not that part. So you will see like an in-between value, and that can even happen with fundamental types. So um, the other thing that can happen is that if you have, for example, like a bool or any other fundamental type, and you set it to false, for example, and then you wait until another thread maybe sets it to true, uh, the compiler sees, uh, all right, but yeah, you're not modifying that, that value in here, right? So I can actually optimize that away. So you will end up with an infinite loop, which is just not what you wrote down. It's not the behavior you want. And the compiler can do this. So um, a generation of audio programmers fixed this particular problem problem with using volatile. <laughs> so ma uh, many people would do it this way. And actually, this fixes this particular problem. Using volatile fixes that particular problem because it tells the compiler, this value can change. Don't optimize on that assumption that it will not change. So this fixes this particular problem, but volatile does not fix any of the other problems. And also, it prevents all compiler optimizations, some of them are actually maybe good for your code. So volatile is definitely the wrong, the wrong way to go here. And um, the classical approach would be to insert, like very simple, just have a mutex where you synchronize that concurrent access. And also in this specific case, it would not be a problem because you would just wait for like one write of a float. But as soon as, like in real world, your audio program will be more complex and then you, you don't, you, you won't, know anymore what you're waiting for and you don't want to block, you don't want to wait for something where you don't know how long it will take. So what you really should do is you should, re, uh, you should use still atomic. And this guarantees that um, you will not have any torn reads or writes because the access will always be atomic. This guarantees that you're lock-free because you're not locking anything anywhere and this guarantees defined behavior and also expresses what you actually want to do. So that's, that's the solution here. If you have uh, the other way around, maybe, your audio callback generates some numbers, and when a specific number changes, 
then maybe you want some element of your graphical user interface to wiggle. That's the other way around. So uh, what you don't want to do, like if you have an audio callback and here you have an atomic float and you, you change its value, what you don't want to do is you want to just from here call your GUI code because this will do some graphical rendering. This is definitely not real time safe. Uh, what you can do instead, which is a little bit better, is you can say, okay, I, I will not render anything in the audio thread, but I can maybe post uh, a message on some kind of message loop and then later the GUI thread will pick that up and re-render that knob. But again, if you, if you post something, like a, if, you, if you do like a notification, something changed and post that to the message thread, probably this procedure is not block free. It will probably allocate something somewhere. And the other, and the, and the other thing is that the audio callback is running a thousand times per second. So you will be congesting your message loop with thousands of messages because the GUI thread typically runs much slower. So uh, one solution to this, which actually works very well in practice for audio code, is that uh, you have some kind of flag, which is also atomic, which says uh, the GUI is up to date or the GUI has changed. And then the only thing that you do in the audio thread is you set that flag, like, oh, I changed something. And then uh, you have, uh, on another thread, you have like a timer, which maybe 30 or 50 times a second, just checks this flag. And this is not such, so much of an overhead on a modern machine, this is not a problem to have this. And then uh, if, if the flag has changed, you update your GUI. And because it's atomic, you should not, uh, uh, you should not uh, do like a normal if. And also the double check locking is, is not appropriate because then you have uh, locks but actually you should use the member functions that stood atomic provides, which is this one, compare exchange strong. If the value is, if is um, false, set it to true and return. And that whole thing is atomic. Um, so with a float, that's easy, right? But how do you do this if you have an object? Maybe you have something more complicated, like a, like a curve that the user can draw, or maybe like a snippet of audio on the disk, and you want to, you want to change this from the GUI thread, and the audio thread will see this. Now, you can actually instantiate something like an atomic widget, and it will actually compile. If, if widget is trivially copyable, uh, it will actually compile, and it will actually semantically do what you want in the, in the sense that it will be proper syn properly synchronized. But uh, if you have a widget, by the way, it's not a GUI widget. It's just like any, any kind of class which is more complicated than a fundamental type. If I have a right widget, that means some class, some user-defined class. But probably setting that class or reading that class is not an atomic instruction on your CPU. So actually what the compiler will do if you try to instantiate this, it will insert some locks internally. You don't even see this. And this is definitely not what you want if you want to be lock-free. Actually, you can check this. There's this member functions is lock-free, which uh, you can, you can um, query whether this atomic type is actually lock-free inside or not. But what you can do is you can, do, you can have atomic pointers, that's fine. So uh, what you end up doing is um, you end up uh, juggling around uh, pointers, like swapping around pointers atomically. And this is sort of the way to do this, but if you go down this road, you find out that it's a very, very painful road. Because, uh, for example, here in the audio thread, you want to do something with that object, so you load you load the pointer value maybe into a variable because you don't want the pointer value to change while you're accessing that object. But then in the GUI thread, you want to change that object, right? So um, what you have to do, because the, the actual pointer swap has to be atomic, you have to create a new copy of that object, which is here, and then you have to do a compare exchange. Okay, is that still the value that I know it should be? And then, okay, publish the new value of that pointer, like publish the new object. And also you want, to, you want that not to happen while the audio thread is using that, right? So you need some, some kind of way to do that, maybe set a flag here or something. And then also you have here a new and you, you swap the pointers here and then you have the old object and you need to get rid of it. So you need to call delete. And whenever you're calling new and delete explicitly, there's like loads of things that can go wrong. So, so, so really you don't want to, to write code like this because this, it's so easy to get this wrong. Um, and what you really want is, there is a class in the standard library, shared putter, which, which lets you automatically handle the lifetime of an object. And what you really want here is you want an atomic shared putter. And unfortunately, in the current standard, there is no such thing as an atomic shared putter like this. But there is one. Uh, 
it's interesting because the interface for it looks like this. You have like std atomic underscore something functions, and then they get a pointer to a shared, shared pointer as an argument. And I don't know why the standard committee did this. Maybe somebody here knows and can tell me. I would be really interested why they, they, they have this interface for shared pointers. But um, in the end, it lets you do what you want. So um, that's the code here. So uh, here um, we are updating a widget, so we're getting maybe some arguments from the user interface. We don't really care about this here. So we create a new widget. Um, we create a new shared pointer to that widget. And then what we can do is we can atomically, by calling the still atomic store, we can atomically swap uh, this new shared putter with the, with the old shared putter. So that's like the current one. And we swap the new one with the current one atomically. And this actually works. And then you don't have to, because it's a shared putter, then the old one will be just disposed of because the shared putter will just run out of scope and if we delete it, you don't have to worry about the lifetime. So that, that's very nice. And in the audio callback, we want to use that object. You, you do an atomic load of the shared putter and you end up with, a, with another shared putter which points to the same object. But because it's, you made a copy of the shared putter, not of the object, just of the shared putter, uh, using an atomic load, uh, this shared putter will point to the same object. Uh, so it will not, like the pointer value will not change, even though if, you, if this happens in the meantime. So you, you can happily use this, this object for your audio computations, and everything will be fine, and you don't have to worry about new and delete. Yes? Yep. <laughs> That's the only problem with this code. If it happened that during this, this execution here, this one swapped around the pointers, then this will go out of scope, and you will have a delete that is implicitly called in the audio callback, which is not what you want to happen. And there's a, there's a very nice solution for this. So um, what you can do is you can have uh, a little release pool, like a garbage collector, which is nice because we're using C++ because it doesn't have garbage collectors, but then we introduce our own garbage collector. So uh, basically, this guy here is uh, something that just has shared putters to objects, and you can add objects to this pool, and then it has like a, every, every now and then it, it checks, oh, is there some, are there some objects that are not referenced by anyone else? And if yes, it cleans them up. And so what you want to do is you want to create a new object, you want to add that to this pool, and then you're fine. And then if it goes out of scope here, the pool will handle it. And here's the code for the pool, for the release pool. So um, you add, uh, so you add something uh, to the pool, and the pool has a std vector of shared putters to void. And Shared putters to void is really one of my favorite features in the standard library because uh, it's, it's really cool. So what it can do, it's like a shared putter to a widget, except that uh, you can give it any object. You can give it a pointer to an int or to a string or to a widget or whatever, and it will swallow it. And it will share this like, ownership reference count with all the other shared pointers to these objects. So this part will work. But uh, in, uh, you can use it for any type, and the best thing is that this thing will also remember. It will have, like, some. It has some trickery inside where it remembers uh, the actual deleter for that object. So if this thing goes out of scope, it will actually call the right destructor for the right polymorphic type that the object actually has, and it knows this because when you edit this to the, when you constructed the shared putter to void, it has some type erasure thing, and it remembers the correct deleter. So it does what you expect it to do, and this is this is really nice. So. Um, you actually can have one pool. So the original version of this was templated for widget, but you can have actually one pool per application. It will swallow happily swallow all your objects. So uh, you add you add an object to the pool. This will just um, in place back a new shared putter to void for that object. So the reference count will go one up, and then you have a timer callback which is called I don't know third maybe once per second or something on a very low priority thread. And what it do, does, it just goes through this pool, which is this vector of shared putters. And whenever the use count is smaller or equal one, which means that this pool is the only class which is referencing that object, it just deletes it. And um, yeah, th this way you get rid, you get rid of that problem here. What, oh, sorry, where was it? Here. 
Uh, so yeah, that's a very nice trick you can you can do to avoid deletes in the audio thread. Yes. Uh, and somewhere you've uh, reserved memory for the pool so that you don't allocate memory on the app for your pool because every time you replace that. Yeah, yeah. So so. So the way this thing is written, that the add, you would not call this on the real-time thread. So you see there's also a normal mutex in here. So the adding, adding to the pool will not happen in the real-time thread, like here. This happens in the, in, the, in the GUI thread. And then you don't have a problem. Uh, you can have, you can, it's like the minimal code you need for this implementation. You can have a more sophisticated version of this, yes? Um, sounds like it could work. We can we can maybe talk about this in more detail after after the talk. I mean, you need to make sure that it's lock free and synchronized right. and everything. Oh, all right, yeah, you can do that. So you can like pre-compute like a big buffer and then have chunks of that that actually the audio thread sees with a yeah. with a smaller. Yeah, you can do this. But then the overall latency will still be the big buffer, right? So uh, you probably don't want to do this if you are. Well, I was saying that you could have uh, different threads actually uh, actually compute these different uh, versions of the buffers, uh, assuming that those buffers are uh, you know independent. Like uh, you know, what if you're computing one, it's not messing around with the other. Yeah, I mean, if you have a lock-free way of picking which one is the next that the audio buffer should take, then. Yeah, I guess this would work. We can we can talk about this in more detail after after the talk because I think we are sort of running out of time a little bit. I have like six minutes left. Okay, so sorry. All right, all right, right. So I'm almost done. So let me just um, quickly go through uh, one more important thing is. So that was if you want to share like a particular object between the audio thread and other threads. So what if you want to exchange data? Like, for example, here you have maybe a user pressing keys and you have messages about the key pressers coming in, or maybe some data from the network or from the disk coming in. And you want, in the audio callback, you want to process these messages, and then the audio that you generate depends on that. And um, you want to do this in a lock free way. So, um, the traditional or the, the, like, the best way to do this in an audio context is to use a lock free queue. And I think the log3q is, or the log3 FIFO is really the uh, most important uh, data structure in, in audio code. And um, if it has a fixed maximum size, then it's actually a log3 ring buffer. And I think this is like this is like the data structure that solves many many problems in audio code. And um, there are implementations of log3 queues. There's one in, in uh, Juice. We have one. There's one in Boost and Boost log3. And there are many people here who know how to properly write log3 queues. So I probably should not show this code here. It also would also take a long time. You could do a whole talk just about that. So let me just um, quickly mention like how you would use it in a more abstract abstract way. And if possible, you want to have like a single thread that writes to it and a single thread that reads through it because you have you can have multiple producers, but then just the code gets more complicated. So instead of coming up with these data structures in audio code, it's typically easier to actually restructure your code to have one reading and one writing thread. And if you have a log free log free ring buffer like this, then typically, if it's this way around, you have another thread, which maybe gets these messages from the keyboard or reads something from the disk and uh, writes them, 
writes them uh, into, into the, uh, the buffer. And log-free means that you have a push and a pop method, and they are implemented block-free with these atomic swaps, atomic compare exchanges that you saw earlier. And it's possible to implement that. Um, so you will have uh, a thread that's pushing items here, and you will have the audio thread that goes around steadily uh, as the audio callbacks tick and pops items. And, and this covers loads of different use cases. When it, wherever you, you're reading audio from a disk or you're getting me live messages from some hardware device, this, this data structure is uh, really almost uh, like a Swiss army knife that, that solves most of these problems. The only thing that you really have to take care of is what happens if one of these pointers overtakes the other. So if you have, uh, for example, uh, a new node comes in and the, this one overtakes the audio thread, then it means that the audio thread hasn't yet written that. So, but the audio thread needs to continue somehow. So either you display, you display an error like, oh, I'm too slow, like I'm too slow to, to process audio, or maybe you can fade out into silence. So this is one, one case that you have to explicitly handle, and this heavily depends on, on your actual use case for this. And the other use case that you have to handle is um, if the audio thread uh, overtakes the, the reader overtakes the writer, then it means that here it will get like the, this is the oldest, oldest data. This is like the newest one and this is the oldest one. So we go this way around. This, this just means that there's no data, which means that if there are nodes, then there's just no nodes played, so you don't have to do anything. Or if there's supposed to be like live audio stream coming from somewhere and it's not there, then also you have to somehow shut down in a reasonable way. So, so these two cases where one overtakes the other is, is uh, really the only thing that you have to care about, which depends on your use case. Otherwise, uh, this data structure solves most of your problems. Also the other way around, if you have uh, the audio callback and it generates data, maybe you want to um, you know, visualize the audio, like you have like an audio generated and you want to have uh, some visualization of that audio for the user, or you want to write this to the, to the disk. The difference here is that then the data is written in a continuous uh, rhythm because the audio callback is like a regular, regular tick. So it's the same thing the other way around. The audio um, thread just pushes its data regularly and just goes round and round and round. And then you have some thread that pops up, pops these um, um, chunks of data that can be really anything. It depends on your use case uh, and does something with them. And here, uh, really, the only thing that you want to make sure is that uh, this one doesn't overtake the audio thread. But this way around is actually much easier because, for example, if you want to render, if you want to render your audio on the screen like this, for example, you want to have something that represents your audio visually, then you don't care. You don't have this real-time um, problem that if you drop like a visual frame, nobody will even notice. That's like the big difference between audio and video, for example. No one will notice if you drop like one of the I don't know, 60 frames per second visually. It's just the audio where you can immediately hear it. So what you can here do is you can actually uh, work with much larger buffers and you can say, okay, if the audio, where's the audio thread? Where, where's the audio thread currently um, writing to? And just take like a chunk of memory just, just before that and just render that. And then you will be fine. And the only thing you have to make sure is that as this goes round and round, it will never actually reach that area. And, and you can actually do this by just making your buffer large enough. And then you don't even have any of the synchronization issues anymore. So, so this is also a common, I think, common pattern in, in audio code that uh, solves a lot of problems. Um, all right, so that's all I have. Um, I really would like to continue at the next occasion talking about more of the aspects of audio code, but this is everything I have for now. So um, thanks for listening. Any questions? Yes. I was wondering how you can enforce a guarantee if no audio dropouts if the user can just add as many effects as they want. Um, well, typically you would have like if you have like a software where you can add like a hundred plugins, you will have like a CPU meter, and then as the user adds the effects, you will see that this goes up, and then you can just display like a message to the user: "Oh, like there was an audio dropout." Like. I can't handle this. So this is what, what many production software programs do. Uh, yes? Uh, in the code example you had where you were talking about the, uh, the audio gain level and switching it to an atomic. Yeah. Um, were you intentionally doing an atomic load every time in the for loop? 
Um, I think actually if a float is atomic on your um, hardware, then actually the compiler would generate the same code, I think. So it wouldn't help at all to just load it once outside the for loop and use the same value inside the Oh yeah, compiler. and yeah, actually you're right. Um, so this, this code will be more efficient if you, if you would put this up here. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, so that's a typo, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Yeah? Um, the condition, you like waiting, the audio thread waiting on a condition variable, but then you're waiting again. Would that be lock free? I don't know. If I don't know that's lock free, I'm not going to use it in an audio card. <laughs> Like, like notify one, notify all these things? I don't know if they're lock free. Maybe somebody can tell me. I, I don't think so. So, no, please not. Don't use them. Yeah. Yes? You still have a new widget every time that you're creating this request. You're creating this object and sharing it. Yes. When we're talking about generality, this widget may be a huge object. Wouldn't it be better to simply have a flag, hey, this object is in use? is in use in this audio thread, atomic flag, then before changing it, just wait on that condition, mm -hmm. change the object again. So the thing with all these, these are just examples, like it just so much depends on your use case, which solution you actually want to do. Let me just find this, the slide here. So yeah, probably, I mean, what you can do here is uh, if you have this pointer in the audio thread, for example, you can do like a, a atomic swap where you can set this to null putter like as a flag, I'm using this in the audio thread right now, and then you can spin weight in the GUI thread on that thing not being null putter anymore, something like this. So there are definitely use scenarios five or seven or 10 milliseconds, whatever. Yeah, so, so that's also a way to do this. Yeah, sure, so you're not crashing the new widget every time. Yeah, so, so it really depends on your use case. If the, whether the widget's like a small one, maybe it's like an envelope with, I don't know, three parameters, or maybe it's like a one megabyte sound file. Well, so that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, in this case, for example, even if you have a big object, like imagine you have like a, a sound file, that's your object, it's huge, it's like one megabyte. But then if you're reading this from disk, you definitely, in the end, you have to create a new object, right? Because it's, it's actually new data, so you have to create a new object for it. Well, sure, sure, that's a different Yeah, and, and if it's something else, maybe you can just... Generally, you don't want to recreate an object, if all you need to do is change it. So if you can boil it down to some like uh, floats or ints that you are changing, then you don't need this. Then you can work with atomic, atomic fundamental types. That's always better, of course. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Thank you.